All right. You guys ready for a message today? Yeah. All right. I'm excited. This is going to be um, a fun one. We've got a story in front of us today. Let me tell you. Uh, this is going to be an interesting one to walk through. Uh, if you haven't been with us or if this is your first time with us, um, we're in a series right now called Crazy Faith where we're just looking at um, the different ways, the different crazy ways in which faith kind of works itself out in our lives and, and how that kind of keeps forcing us to level up in our relationship with God. How it forces us to kind of get to know him better, lean on him more, understand him better, grapple with that a little bit, wrestle with it. Um, and, and as we do that today, we've got a story in front of us from um, Acts chapter 19. So if you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and turn in those with us. Or if you're online, go ahead and turn uh, in your Bible with us to Acts 19. This is a different story, okay? And I'm just going to warn you about that right now. I'll be real honest with you. I haven't heard a lot of other messages on this story. But the Bible says that, you know, all of Scripture is useful. So this will <laughs> be a good one. All right, I'm in Acts chapter 19. I'm going to start with verse 13, and I'm going to go all the way through verse 17, where it says this. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Seba, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them. So I want, I want you to just picture this for a minute, okay? These guys are going around. The sons of Seba, they're going around, and, and they're trying to cast out demons, and they're trying to do the work of the gospel and all of that kind of stuff. And, and as they're doing that, there's certain things that you would expect to see happening. This isn't one of them. Having a demon turn around and clap back at them isn't one of them, Okay? But that's exactly what's going on here, okay? Uh, verse 15, one day the evil spirit answered them. Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? Who are you? The, then the man who had the evil spirit, watch this now, jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. And the name of Jesus, the name of the Lord Jesus, was held in high honor. Oh my gosh. We've got a situation here where some people are trying to do work in Jesus' name, and then a demon comes along and he talks back at them and he beats them up. Happy Sunday. Go home. That's it. That's the whole message. No, it, what a crazy story. My message title today is called Forgery Faith. Forgery Faith. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Let's ask Jesus to speak in this moment. Jesus, we ask that you would, um, that you would really speak to us about what this means in this story from Acts 19 because there's so much actually in here for us to learn and maybe from some unexpected places. So as we do that today, we just surrender our understanding to you, help our minds to understand, help our ears to hear, and help our lives to live out the truth that you've called us to live. All God's kids said, amen, amen. Hey, I did something last week that I'm really excited about. I have been waiting for five years uh, to do this. That's a long time to wait to, to, to do this, and, and I've been waiting for it to happen uh, the entire time. And, and to be honest, I got to a point where I didn't think it was going to happen. Um, it, it's just something that I bought. It's something that I purchased. It's an item that I'm now in possession of. And, and everywhere I've seen this item sold, they're just insanely expensive, and, and I've just never been able to justify the cost uh, of this particular item. So along the way, what I've done is every time that I've seen something that's kind of like it, or that, you know, advertises some feature that kind of does what it does. I, I've bought that, especially if it's cheaper. And then I bring it home, and it never does what it says it's going to do. Either it doesn't work as well as what I was going to buy, or, or it just doesn't function, or it just breaks down all the time because it was cheaper, and it wasn't made well, or it, you know, falls apart. It's just not as good as advertised. So every time I would need it, I would go to grab it, and I'd either be cursing the thing that I have, right? Or I'd just be wishing I still had the one I used to have a long time ago. Do you want to know what it is? It's this. 
Does anybody know what this is? It is a can opener, but, but, you laugh at me, I'm going to tell you what. This can opener is not just any can opener. This, my friends, is the pampered chef. Smooth edge, no effort, can opener, okay? Do you understand what that means? I mean, hey, listen, effortless cranking, effortless, okay? Smooth edges on the inside of the can and the outside of the, no more nasty, jagged metal that's cutting you up when you try to get that can, uh, like, off and get it open, little grabby tool, grabby tool. Why? So I don't have to get my fingers all in the ishiness down there. Just grab it, pick it up, put it in the garbage. I'm sorry, the recycling. Put it in the recycling, okay? <laughs> right? This, this isn't just any can opener. This is the Cadillac of can openers, my friends, okay? This is the gold standard right here. This right here is a cornucopia of can opening convenience is what this is. Okay? I make tacos probably once a week in my house. Okay? Anybody else like that? Yeah. I make tacos once a week in my house. And, and I'm going to tell you right now, the sliced olives in my pantry are living in fear. <laughs> I'm trying to keep it serious. About my can opener. About the pampered chef can opener. But everywhere I've gone, it's always just been expensive. And it's, I've, I've always kind of complained about the price and all of that kind of stuff. And by the way, yes, I do know that sliced olives do come, uh, like with pop can tops, soda can tops now, that you can open those up. You don't even need a can opener right now. But here's the thing. I, I don't live high on the hog and shop at Target like some of y'all spoiled people, okay? I shop at Walmart, Okay, and at Walmart, we open cans the way God intended for us to open cans. With our one healthy tooth. Just, it's a Walmart joke. It's okay. Okay, it's all right. Okay, I'm going to get emails about that. Okay, or we use a can opener. We actually use a can opener. And listen, here's what's funny about this. If I took all the money that I've spent, this is for real, on other can openers, imitation can opener. Can openers that were advertising themselves as being as good or, or close to this one or have this feature or that feature. If I added it all up, I could have probably bought four of these stupid things. Isn't that funny? You have stuff in your life like that? Because listen, what do you learn when you do stuff like this? You learn that fakes don't last. The fake stuff doesn't last. The fakes are dull. The fakes break down. The fakes don't open things as easily as they promise to open things. But I kept buying them and replacing them and buying them and replacing them and buying them and replacing them. I'm telling you right now, I'm a reformed pastor, okay? I'm done with all that. I'm coming for those olives on Taco Tuesday next week, and it's going to be a lot of fun. And listen, the reason I bring, some of you are like, what is he talking about right now, right? The reason I bring all of this up is because in Acts chapter 19, we have one of the strangest, most insane stories in the entire Bible about an interaction between a demon and somebody who is a person of faith. I'm, I'm just telling you right now, if you've never read start to finish the book of Acts, if you want to read some crazy stories, you should read the book of Acts. It'll blow your mind. Uh, but this story, it's all about fakes, and it's all about phonies. See, most of the time when we hear stories about demons in the New Testament, isn't it true that, I mean, what we hear about are the stories where Jesus is casting out demons. Jesus is saving people from being demon-possessed. Jesus is, is casting out demons from young children, and he's casting out demons from women, and he's casting demons into like a herd of pigs that then go crashing down into a river where they drown themselves. Like it's, all, it's, like it's a lot of supernatural power that's exercised over demons. And Jesus said in Mark 16 that his followers are supposed to do the thing that he was doing. In fact, in John 14, he says that my followers will do even greater things than I have ever done. So I'm supposed to do even greater things than what Jesus did. And, and so if that's the case, then why not just do what our boys, the sons of Siva, did? Why didn't it work? Well, it didn't work because there's a problem here. 
And, and we notice it right away in the story, in verse 13, right away. The text tells us some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus. Everybody say, tried to invoke. They tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Everybody say, whom Paul preaches. I command you to come out. Now, you've got to catch this. You've got to catch this. This is the key to understanding this text, okay? The Bible says that these guys tried to invoke the name of Jesus. Just like I tried to go to the gym and bench press 300 pounds, okay? That's what I tried to do, okay? They tried to do it. And really what it means is that they, they're trying to create an experience of God that they themselves have never had, okay? They're trying to conjure it up. They're trying to get the formula right. They're trying to get the incantation right so that all the special things can then happen. And, and what would happen is they would go to the demons and they would say to the demons, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Not in the name that I preach. Not in the faith that I have. Not because of what I believe. Because I have faith. It's in whom Paul preaches and has faith. It, see, the, the faith that these guys are using, it doesn't belong to them. It's an imitation faith. It's a fake faith. And it, there's no pampered chef can opener that they've got going on here, okay? In fact, the only person opening up a can in this story is the demon, okay? This is, this is what I want to talk with you about today. It's forgery faith. Forgery faith. It's the faith that we copy from other people, and we apply it to our own lives. It's a faith that promises to do what real faith can do. And then here's the thing. It's sneaky. Because what forgery faith will do is that it looks right, like real faith, and it talks like real faith, and it acts like real faith, but it isn't real faith. It isn't real faith. And that's tough. It's a faith that says, I don't want to pay the cost to get the real deal, to get one of my own. So I'm just going to faith it through my problems the way grandma did. Or I'm just going to make it look as cool as that church does. Or I'm just going to fake it like a person of faith on Sunday, and then on Monday, I'm going to maybe borrow a line from a book, or maybe a line from a sermon that I heard last Christmas when I, was in, when I was in church to answer this question or deal with this problem, even though I have no idea at all what it means, and I've never even thought about applying it to my own individual life. So I'm just inviting you to join me on the bandwagon of my own uncertainty. That's forgery faith. That's forgery faith. It's a faith that's writing checks against somebody else's faith account. Does that make sense? And here's the thing. For a lot of us, now listen, this is where faith can start. This is where we start learning how to walk in faith and learning how to live life with Jesus, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. There, 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 there's actually a lot of value in imitating grandma's faith. Some of us, there's a lot we could gain if we would just have some faith the way grandma did, okay? But this is where it gets sneaky because, of course, you should read books and, of course, you should listen to sermons and all of that kind of stuff. But forgery faith is a faith that stays outside of you. It stays at a safe distance, and it never gets internalized, and it never gets digested, and it never becomes a part of you. And if your faith never becomes your own, if it's never genuine or authentic or name brand, if it's never alive in your own heart, if it's never applied to your own life, applied to your own circumstances, applied to your own problems, applied to your own feelings, applied to your own situation, then here's the thing. You're going to end up with a faith that's just like a cheap can opener. It's dull. It's going to break the second you put some pressure on it. Just, it's going to crack. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come apart as soon as you try to use it, and, and, and under pressure especially, and it'll never open up the things in your life that faith should be opening up with ease. That's forgery faith. That's an imitation faith. You want to get to crazy faith? If you want to have a crazy faith, then I'm just going to tell you it's got to be real it's got to be the name brand kind of faith. This has to be Jesus alive at work in your life. It can't be a forgery. 
It can't belong to someone else. It can't be something that says one thing on the package, but then you go to like use it and it just falls apart in your hands. It's got to be something that's lived out in your real life. Can I explain why forgery faith doesn't work from this text today? Is that all right? All right. The first thing, and listen, I'm just, I'm going to be shooting real straight with you guys today, okay? I'm, I'm, some of this stuff, I'm just going to say it, and then we're going to work it out, okay? The first reason that forgery faith doesn't work in your life is that, number one, hell isn't afraid of the fake stuff. Hell is not, hell has no fear of your fake faith. And listen, this is such a strange story to include in the Bible, isn't it? Why, why would Luke, Luke is the author of the book of Acts, why would he want us to know about one of the sons of Siva getting beat up by a demon? Like, isn't it, it, doesn't that actually discredit Jesus, the name of Jesus, to some degree? I mean, this guy's trying to act <clears throat> in the name of Jesus. He, he's, he's trying to do what he was told to do. And not only does it not work, but it completely backfires. So why talk about, like, why are we including this in the book of stories of the Acts of the Apostles? Well, I think the reason is because Paul wants us to understand something, or he wants us, Luke wants us to understand something about faith. Not from the priest, not from the guy going around doing the exorcisms, but from what happened to him. He wants you to understand what happened to this guy. Did you hear what the demon told this man? The man tries to cast out the demon, like a la peanut butter sandwiches. I'm going to say the, the right word, the right formula, the right incantation, and, and he's saying the right thing. And then the demon, according to what we know, he's supposed to just run away, right? But he doesn't. In fact, he turns around, and he's got something to say to the person trying to cast him out. This is what the demon's response is. And honestly, this is where the lesson is, Okay. He says, Jesus, I know. And, and Paul, I know about. But who are you? Now listen, this should send chills up and down your spine right here. Okay? This man is doing what somebody told him to do. He, he, he's, he's saying what somebody taught him to say. And the response from an actual demon is to turn around and start chirping and talking smack at him. Saying, well, listen, I know who Jesus is, and I don't mess with the son. And I know who Paul is. That dude scares the you-know-what out of me, okay? He wants me to, like, I, I want to run for the hills, packing all my bags, going back to where I came from when, when Paul's around. But you, nobody's ever heard of you, boy. Nobody. Your name has never come up at Hell's Water Cooler. There's nobody game planning for you. There's nobody talking about you. Nobody where I come from has ever even heard of you. And believe me, if you're somebody who had any authority or any threat or any kind of real faith at all, if your faith were anything that I should even be a little bit worried about, I'd know who you are. But I don't. You know why? Because you're nobody. Now that's cold, okay? Even for a demon. That's a cold and bold statement. Do you know that the Bible says that even demons have faith? James 1, or I'm sorry, James chapter 2, 19 says, you believe that there's one God. Good, even demons believe that and shudder. So even James is saying, hey, uh, demons have faith too, okay? In other words, the one with the real faith in this story, watch this, it isn't the guy trying to cast out the demon. It's the demon. Now, why is this important, Seth? What is going on in this story? The reason it's important is because in your life, in my life, there are real battles that need to be fought. There is real battle against depression. There's a real battle against anxiety. There's a real battle against fear. There's a real battle against apathy and just stagnation. There's a real battle against past traumas and hurts and things that cause us to not do the things that we should do. And a lot of people think that demon possession is something where you have to be like flopping around on the ground and foaming at the mouth to show evidence of the spiritual battle that you're in. Okay? That's how it works. Can I tell you a secret? 
It isn't always that sensational. It, it, it's not always that way. All that needs to happen, watch this, is for the forces of hell, for the forces of hell to believe that you're in a battle when you don't. That's all that needs to happen. A lot of people think that demon possession is something where you have to be, you know, just kind of showing all kinds of signs of it. I'm telling you, you can be in the battle and not be showing any signs of it. You can actually be not even aware of it. Now, I'm not, understand, I'm, I'm not trying to be all weird and spiritual with you in this mi- in moment. I, I'm not trying to, like, stir anything up or make you scared of anything. I'm, I'm just trying to tell you, if you want to beat your addiction, you can't do it with forgery faith. If you want to fight the problem in your marriage, you're going to have to have faith that Jesus is 100% is, he is who he says he is, and he is that not to anybody else, but he is that to you. You want to overcome your depression? You can own all the imitation can openers you want to own. It'll never open up what you want it to open up. They're going to break Every single time. You you, want to fix the situation with your teenager and parent them the way that Jesus wants you to parent them? Well, you better start stepping up and owning your faith. Making that stuff your own. You're going to need it in the battle that's ahead of you. See, hell isn't afraid of the, 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 the fake stuff. Hell's not scared of the fake stuff. Forgery faith is going to keep you locked up. You're going to get beat up and beat down to the point that you're going to be discouraged, you're going to be sick of it, and you're going to be sick of trying every single time. To get through this stuff, you have to have a faith that can handle getting down in the dirt and getting messy a little bit in a faith that isn't afraid to go to battle. You've got to have a faith that's raw and that's real and that you believe in it even when you're under attack. Okay? Come on, somebody say, it's got to be personal. If I'm going to overcome my problems, if I'm going to have a, have, have, a, have a victory in my life, then my faith has got to be authentic. It's got to be a faith that's a kind of a faith where, like, I've died to myself and I've picked up my cross kind of faith. My faith has had a price to it. I've had to fight for this faith. I've had to go to battle with this faith. I've had to wrestle with what it means for my life and who I am and and how I live and how I've lost and how I've won and what I'm facing and all of that stuff. It's got to be a faith that hell is actually scared of, which means I've got to own it. That's a faith your demons are going to hear about, okay? Now, listen, I I can sit here and I can preach a sermon on a Sunday morning all all day long. That's, That's fine. I'm just telling you that the power of the message on Sunday is how you apply it to how you live on Monday. That, that's where the power is. You, you've got to go into your battles in, in such a way that it's real. If you go into your battles this coming week, and, and what you're saying to yourself is, by the power of Pastor Seth and what he said on Sunday, okay, I command that my depression be lifted. You know, by the power of what Pastor Seth said, my anxiety should be defeated. If that's what you're saying, if by the power of whoever it is I'm quoting, I'm going to quote this at my fear, my tuition should be paid. Okay? In the, in the power of, I, I command that all my relationships be healed. Can, can I just be real honest with you? I don't have that much power. Okay? I don't. No, no preacher, no pastor does. Now listen, I can help you. And we can talk this through, and, I, and we can apply God's word and, and learn about Jesus together, but I can't live this out for you. Do, you, do you. do you see the difference there? The sons of Siva wanted to claim Paul's faith and all of the power that comes with it with, without actually having a faith of their own. The power of God is in your relationship, not your recitation. Does that make sense? Okay? You develop your relationship with Jesus in the middle of your battle, and that's something hell will actually be scared of. See, I, I'm just telling you that when your demons have more faith in God than you do, you're going to get real hurt. And you're going to lose a lot of battles that way. I've seen so many people, so many people who mean well and who want good things in their life. I've seen so many people 
fall away from church and fall away from faith and lose their battles, not because God is unwilling to act in their lives, but because their demons had a more personal faith than they did. That's why. And that leads me to the second reason that forgery faith just doesn't work in your life, and it's this, that there's no such thing as fake it till you make it. There's only fake it till you break it. No such thing as fake it till you make it. You know, this story from Acts chapter 19 is such an odd chain of events that's going on. It, it seems so counter to everything that we tend to think of as true about faith or church, that if I just say the right thing long enough, right, and, and if I just do the right thing long enough, then, then life has to, by definition, just constantly be getting better. Isn't, isn't that how it's supposed to work? That I go to church and I say the things and I do the prayers and I say the stuff, and then all of a sudden my life is supposed to be cleaner. My life is supposed to be easier in the middle of that situation if I just do those things, because that's the formula, right? That's how it works. I wish I could tell you that that's even been my own experience as a pastor. But it hasn't been. It hasn't been. Several years ago, I was pastoring a church that uh, was going through a really difficult season in its ministry, and, and it, it, the whole thing was taking a particularly huge toll on me on a really personal level. Um, depression was beginning to set in, anxiety was beginning to really build in my life, and it was just taking this big toll on me behind the scenes. And, and I would share this with other pastors and just kind of ask for some advice or ask for some help in the middle of it. And, and, and it, going through all this stuff, I would still preach. I would still lead. I'd still do all the things that a pastor's supposed to do in, in that situation. But the truth was that inside, inside, I was dying. Just dying on the vine. Here's what's amazing to me. I had other pastors, people of faith, coming up to me, and maybe you've had this experience too, and they would say things to me like, brother, don't quit before the breakthrough. Don't quit before the breakthrough. If God brought you to it, he'll bring you through it. Okay? If God, God won't give you nothing you can't handle. And, 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 and this, one, this one was my favorite. Boy, what you got to do is fake it till you make it. You got to fake it till you make it. Fake it till I make it? What does that even mean? I don't understand. I don't, I don't even get that. Don't quit before the breakthrough? What if quitting is the breakthrough? Have you ever thought of that? If God brought me to it, so he's going <laughs> to... He's going to get me through it. So you're saying that every single circumstance in my life and in my ministry is something that is a, like, is from God? Have you asked the sons of Siva how believing that plays out? Now, you might be asking, oh, how could pastors, these are like men of the cloth, okay? How, how could pastors be giving such terrible advice, Seth? Where does this even come from? Well, it comes from the fact that even in the church, come on now, we live in an Instagrammable world, people, okay, where we put a lot of filters on a lot of different things. We edit things, and we only show the world our highlight reel. We don't show them what we're really struggling with. We're only going to show the wins. We're not going to talk about the losses too much. We are a people who are so obsessed with image that we care more about how we look in the struggle than solving the struggle itself. What would, if I were to be real about this with people, like what would people think of me? How would that, how would that, I'm a pastor. Like this is what I preach. How am I, how am I supposed to admit that, that this is what, like I'm supposed to be the one casting the, de casting the demons out, not getting beat up by them, right? So our answer in the church where we preach a crucified Savior who died for our sins is fake it till we make it. Eventually it'll work out. In the meantime, put a smile on your face, go about your business, act happy because that's what good Christians do. You put a filter on that. You don't show the world the pain. You don't show them the mess. You want to know why this man in Acts 19 is known <laughs> as the, one of the sons of Siva, it's because guess who wants to get popular and famous for casting out demons? You think it's him? It's not. It's Siva. Okay? 
Siva is the one trying to do this. Like, like, your name doesn't even matter, man. This struggle has left him beat up, and we don't even know this dude's name. But he's the one taking the beating. All we know is that this group went around trying to cast out demons with a forgery faith, and they're getting known for it. They're getting a reputation for it. And it nearly killed this guy. Why? Because here's what I've learned in my life. And, and, and please do not take this long to learn this in your own, okay? It took me way too long to learn this about my own faith. That there's no such thing as fake it till you make it. It, it doesn't exist. There's only fake it till you break it. I'm not saying you should just walk around being a big open sore to everybody who comes and talks to you. Hey, Seth, how you doing? Oh, my God, you have no idea. That's not what I'm saying, okay? You've got to be wise in who you share your pain with and who you share your struggles with. I'm just saying that when you're trying to open up the can and unpack what's inside of your hurts and your problems and your anxieties, like your healing has got to come from a personal place of faith. It's got to be something that's real and authentic to you, where you personally, you have found God in your struggle. You have found God in your grief. He's had something to say to you to bring you back from the place that you've entered into. Otherwise, all you're going to do is you're just going to keep breaking can openers on stuff and wondering why this isn't working and feeling like it's maybe your fault to begin with. And the, the, the whole thought process that happens here takes us down a very negative, ro negative road. It's going to leave you beat up, son of Siva. Now, please understand, this is actually, <laughs> I know it doesn't sound like it, but this is good news. This is good news. I'm actually trying to encourage you here that there is more, there's more power in being real with God about your pain, real with him about your struggle, real with him about your grief, than there is in a thousand filters that would get a thousand likes and that would cover it all up. God cannot heal what you refuse to surrender. Life is way too messy to survive it with a forgery faith that fakes it till it makes it. Jesus, Jesus himself was the most real and authentic human being who's ever lived. And if we're supposed to be like him, then that means that there can't be an inauthentic bone in our bodies, even when we're afraid of how other people might view it or how it might look. Guys, church is a place where it should be okay to not be okay. Church is not a platform for getting famous. It's not a platform for working your way up some stupid ladder. Church isn't a place where we develop little subgroups like the sons of Seth. Okay? That's not what we're doing here. Church is a place where broken people get to know Jesus together. That's what we do. And this is where our faith can take a turn. Because this is the third piece I want to say about this, about our forgery faith. That the power is in the personal. The power is in the personal. And maybe you do this too, but I, I, I follow a lot of churches on Instagram and Facebook and all that kind of stuff. Follow a lot of pastors, a, a lot of preachers, just different things like that. And so I, I've just kind of noticed in the last little while that every Sunday afternoon scroll, it all kind of looks the same. Have you noticed that? It's the same pictures of huge giant stages, camera angles to make it look like there's more people in the room than there really are. <laughs> you don't think we do that? <laughs> uh -huh. Right? Oh, the professional lighting, the greeters out front are always smiling. They're never just unhappy, grumpy greeters. These are always the best-looking greeters anybody's ever found. It's like someone went to a magazine and said, you and you, you're going to be our greeters. It's, it's insane, these pictures that come out. And, and I understand that. I get that. There's an element. I, I, I get it. I, it. Image matters and blah, 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 blah. But do you know what I wish I saw more of? I wish I saw more pictures in my Sunday afternoon scroll 
of like husbands and wives praying together and crying. I wish I saw fewer well-groomed hipsters and young urban professionals who spent 10 times as much on their outfit as they ever put in an offering basket, I'm going to tell you that. And more pictures of the attic that showed up in a torn jeans and a beat up t-shirt and getting a big old hug on their way in the door. I wish I saw more pictures of more churches less willing to rage against some battle uh, against the, 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 the symptoms of sin in our culture in, in churches that were more willing to get real and down and dirty in battle against the demons that are actually raging for somebody's soul. Just show people that they're loved right where they are. That, that's, that's, what we're, that's what we're doing. Listen, th the power of faith has nothing to do with the image we project. It's about how personal it becomes. The more personal it becomes, the more real it's going to get, the more power you're going to have. This poor dude in Acts chapter 19, he's not getting beat up because he can't overcome his demons. He's getting beat up because the God that Paul preaches is not yet the God that he knows. That's why. He's getting beat up because Siva told him that this is what successful people do in the church. And this is what successful people say in the church. And this is how successful people talk. This is what they do. This is how they go around and they find the broken people. This is what Siva said all the success is all about. It's an incant. It's a, it's a formula. It's just something that we're walking through every single day. Nobody told this guy that the real power in the very real world of your spiritual life, the power in the message of your life, and by the way, yes, your life does have a message, it isn't in what you look like. It's not in the formula that you say or follow. It's in what you believe and the extent to which you're willing to live it out. That's power. That's something that's going to overcome something. If you're willing to get real with God about the fact that you don't have it all together and you don't know what you're doing and, and, and that it really is by his power and his grace and his mercy and his love that any darkness can possibly ever get cast out of anything, that's when your can opener is going to start opening some things up a little more effortlessly. God doesn't want you to have an imitation can opener. You've been putting off stepping into the real thing long enough. You've settled for enough imitations for it in your life long enough because it was going to cost you too much. You thought that if you really go out and you really get that authentic faith, you really live it, like you're going to have to give something up or you're not going to have as much fun. It's not going to be as enjoyable. All your friends are going to talk about you. Like you, that's what you thought you're going to have to lose more than you gain by going out and getting what God called you to go get from the very beginning. In fact, he gave it to us in his son. You've tried enough knockoffs of that that didn't work. So here's the difference. Just make it personal. That's where there's power. When you have a faith that isn't scared to, you're not scared to run at the gates of hell in a full sprint to take back what the enemy stole from you, because there's nothing that the enemy can do to me that God can't bring me back from to begin with. When you have that kind of a faith where you really do act and talk and walk as if the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. When you have the kind of faith that can get back up after you've been knocked down and get back up again after you've been knocked down and get back up again after you've been knocked down. When you've got that kind of faith that says, listen, I'm tired, I'm bleeding, I'm hurting, I'm scared, but by the power of Jesus Christ, whom I preach, because he's alive and well within me, and in my life, my experience, my story, I command this darkness out of my life. When you can own it like that, that's when you've got a faith that hell is scared of. That's when the demons start talking about you behind the water cooler, okay? 
that's going to open up some cans. This is where connections start getting made. This is where people will start understanding the scriptures. And, oh, I get how this connects to this and how this part of my life hooks up with this part of the scripture. And this is where, like, all the neural pathways of your faith just start bling, 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 bling. It's like a pinball machine. This is where it starts getting real and brokenness stops. This is where generational patterns get healed. This is where real faith gets developed. And you know where that starts? It starts with you taking off the the filters and just inviting Jesus into the places that you've been beat up and saying, Jesus, I am powerless against the darkness that is against me. But you aren't. So I need you in this moment, right here, right now, walking with me. I need you to remind me. I need you to encourage me. I need you to comfort me. I need you to give me a pillow when I'm tired, and I need you to be my rock when I need a foundation. I need you to walk with me through everything I'm going through. I want to know who you are and where you are, even when I don't feel it. That's when it becomes real. It's just saying, Jesus... I need you to make this personal to me. I need you to become not just my grandma's Jesus, my preacher's Jesus, the book I read's Jesus, the one I saw on Instagram, the one I saw on Facebook. I need you to be my Jesus right here. And for anybody who would like that to happen, I'd like you to go ahead and we're going to bow our heads in prayer. And I want to invite you in this moment whether it's your first time asking Jesus or, or into, into the pain and the struggle in your life and making him Lord and Savior over your life, or, or, or whether it's something where you just need Jesus to walk with you in the middle of what you're going through, I want to invite you to close your eyes and bow your heads. And in your hearts, just pray this after me, that Jesus, I give you my life. I ask that you'd defend me. I ask that you'd encourage me. I ask that you'd walk with me through everything I'm walking through. I'm surrendered to you. I'm giving you all of me. So give me all of you in the middle of everything that I'm walking through. I pray these things in your name and for your sake.